This video is on uh, some preliminaries. So we're going to talk about models, estimators and Monte Carlo studies. And we're going to talk about maximum likelihood estimation. To start with models versus estimators. So what I've done here is I've written down an econometric model that should look familiar. So we have a dependent variable yi for individual i that's measured in our data. We have a vector xi of explanatory variables and we have a parameter beta, uh, parameter vector beta that we wish want to estimate. And there's an error term epsilon i. Now uh, throughout um, uh, this course um, I'm going to have xi uh, as a row vector. So that means xi has the dimension 1 by k, uh, if k is the number of variables um, that we use on the right hand side, and xi will generally um, include a constant term. So the first element of xi is a 1, so that um, for this model here the first element of beta will be uh, the constant term the intercept of the regression line. Good. Uh, so um, now xi is 1 by k, let's say. Beta is um, k by 1, so that xi beta together is 1 by 1, as usual. Now, um, what are the usual assumptions in the simplest possible case um, that we're making um, uh, when we uh, think about OLS estimation? Uh, so um, the simplest possible case um, has IIDness in the sense that observations are independent across individuals and um, they are, the epsilons are identically uh, distributed uh, uh, for each individual. Uh, the key assumptions uh, for OLS to work are these three in those three bullet points here. Uh, so first of all, the rank condition. So uh, here I've written it uh, in a particular way and one can write this in, in, in various ways. It depends also on um, the way one teaches this model. Um, so here I've written that um, the um, uh, product xi prime xi in expectation has full rank. Uh, so uh, let's think about the dimensions uh, quickly. Um, so xi is 1 by k if k is the number of elements in xi, um, so xi prime will be k by 1, and this is multiplied by something that is um, 1 by k, so xi prime xi is going to be k by k, and the expectation of that is of course also uh, k by k, and this is assumed uh, to have full rank. Then we're assuming that the error term epsilon i on average is 0, and that is a so-called normalization. Okay, so um, here I'm not saying anything um, about uh, the dependence uh, between the error term and xi. Uh, so sometimes you would see the assumption that the uh, expectation of x uh, epsilon i conditional on xi is zero, and that's a much stronger assumption because it means that for any value of xi, uh, the expectation of epsilon i is going to be zero. Here the assumption is um, weaker. The assumption is that on average um, or in expectation um, over all xi's, um, the epsilon uh, is um, a zero in expectation. Okay, and that, that is called a so uh, that, that is a so-called normalization. What is a normalization? A normalization is like an assumption, but um, a normalization does not um, restrict the data that we observe in any way. So now I have to explain this, of course, to you what, what I mean by that. So um, let's think of the data that we have as coming from this model. Okay, so if I would now um, say that the expectation of epsilon i is not 0 but 2, um, then I could still generate the exact same distribution of y uh, for a given x um, that I have in my data. Uh, so um, uh, how could I do that? Well, if the expectation of epsilon i is equal to 2 instead of 0, 
The only thing I would have to do at the same time to make this work is um, to um, decrease uh, the value of the first element of beta by two, right? Um, because then uh, uh, this uh, will cancel out, let's say. Okay, if you wanna uh, learn more about normalizations, I do recommend that you have a look at um, chapter 3.8 in the lecture notes. Um, this was um, a very brief uh, description and we're gonna come back to normalizations later in the course, um, but it's actually a good idea um, to, uh, to read up on this um, at this point, if you like. The third assumption is um, the exogeneity assumption that you might've seen before in terms of uh, the conditional expectation of epsilon. Uh, given X, um, here I've written it, um, as a uh, zero covariance. Uh, so epsilon i is um, zero in expectation. And that this means uh, in turn that this term here is actually the covariance between x i and epsilon i. And if that covariance is equal to zero, then um, we call uh, x i exogenous. And you've learned before that exogeneity is a key assumption um, that we do make. Now, this is the model. Uh, the, the entire first bullet point here um, describes my econometric model. And the, the, the way to think about this is always that the data that we do have and that we analyze, um, they uh, have been generated by this model. So we assume that this model is correct. Um, and our wish is uh, to estimate beta, the unknown parameter. Now, um, this brings us um, to identification. Um, and identification is discussed in chapter 3.4 and in chapter 3.6 in lecture notes. Um, here I'm giving you a very brief um, discussion of identification. So a very brief definition of identification is that once we know the distribution of yi given xi for all values of xi, or at least some values of xi, um, then we know beta. Uh, so then we can estimate um, beta. Uh, so if you give me um, as much data as I ever want uh, so that I know the distribution of y given x, then I can tell you what the true value beta is. And um, without ident identification, um, estimating something doesn't quite make sense because if we can't um, achieve what we want to achieve with as much data as we would ever like to have, then uh, with a finite sample, um, uh, it's, it's becoming even less promising. Uh, so in that sense, it's necessary for estimation. Okay, so that's identification. So think of identification as um, the question, if I have as much data as I want in terms of the number of observations, can I in principle estimate beta? Um, and then the third um, bullet point on this um, slide here gives you an estimator. Uh, there are many estimators um, that we could uh, use and some are bad, some are good, uh, some are consistent, some are unbiased, some are biased, etc., etc. But an estimator is given here and that is of course um, the estimator uh, we have all seen before. That is the ordinary least squares estimator. I've written it here as beta hat. Um, so that would be the first part would be um, xi prime xi summed up um, uh, over all individuals, then the inverse. So that is that is uh, k by k, uh, as I explained before. Um, and then the inverse of that um, times um, the sum uh, over all individuals of xi prime yi. So let's think about dimensions. Uh, so xi prime is gonna be k by one, yi is gonna be one by one. So this is k by one, the second um, term here, this is k by k. So what we end up with is k by k times k by one. So it's something that is gonna be k by one. And that's of course um, the vector of estimates um, beta hat. Um, and these are estimates 
for um, the coefficients in beta. Okay, uh, so that's the estimator uh, for beta. And this estimator is a distribution in finite samples and this distribution can be approximated using asymptotic theory. So what we do when we um, uh, use asymptotic theory is we make the thought experiment of letting the number of observations uh, go to infinity and then um, uh, we see um, how um, uh, that distribution depends on the number of observations and from that um, we go back and uh, can figure out what uh, the variance covariance matrix um, looks like uh, for beta hat and that is then used of course um, to get standard errors and uh, to get confidence intervals and to do tests. So that's in a nutshell um, um, what we um, what we mean when we distinguish between a model and an estimator um, and um, at the same time one has to uh, think about identification because it, there's no point in using an estimator uh, if there is no identification as I said. Good, uh, so um, an empirical work, uh, there's, there's a, a typical workflow um, and um, it usually looks like this. Uh, so you obtain data, uh, you clean it, um, you export it um, or save it. Uh, then you either analyze it in say Stata or some other package, software program, um, or you export it somewhere else. Um, or you use R altogether, or you use Python, or Julia, or whatever. Um, so um, many, many things um, uh, can be used. Um, and, and this course obviously um, uh, does not uh, um, tell you, or I'm not going to tell you that you have to use uh, one program or another. What I will advise you to do is to actually learn as many um, uh, languages as possible. Um, then you uh, can always pick the language that uh, suits your needs best um, uh, once uh, you're doing uh, some empirical work yourself. Um, now, um, what we're going to do here, though, is uh, we're going to use MATLAB. Okay. Uh, um, if you want to know more about workflows, um, there's an initiative here at Tilburg University. It's called Tilburg Science Hub. Um, here's the address under which you can look at um, what we do there. Um, and then there is a um, uh, little uh, guide um, that is already a few years old um, that you can find here. It's by uh, Jensko and uh, Shapiro. Um, so I would um, highly recommend having a look uh, at um, these two websites uh, so that you um, know about them. And uh, once you do empirical work yourselves, um, most likely already in um, either your term paper or um, your research master thesis or in your first paper then, um, this will be very, very useful to you. So it's a small investment that you would uh, make uh, to set everything up uh, in a proper way and will, uh, I promise you, um, pay off down the road. Good. The next thing I want to um, talk about here in this uh, prelim uh, part of the course is uh, Monte Carlo analysis. Um, so you might have heard about that before. Most likely you have about, heard about that before, but simply to repeat that. So in a Monte Carlo analysis, what we do is um, instead of using data, we um, would take the model and we um, create it um, using uh, the model for given chosen values of the parameters. And then um, we um, take an estimator and estimate those parameters, right? So we, we generate data and then we estimate them. We generate again data, we estimate uh, the parameters, we generate again data, always with the same parameter values, but then we estimate. Uh, so what, what we get is, uh, let's say, R um, um, replications of that. So we do this R times. Um, and, and what we uh, do each time is we, we draw the x's anew and we draw the epsilons anew. So we um, generate uh, each time new y's. And what we end up with is um, R, uh, capital R sets of estimates of the parameters. And the distribution um, uh, across replications um, of these um, estimates uh, approximates uh, the asymptotic distribution of the estimator. Um, now, this is very standard in econometric theory papers. Uh, so an econometric theory paper would often uh, describe a situation um, uh, 
um, and, and, and then uh, propose a new way of um, estimating something that is of interest. Um, and then it would um, show in a Monte Carlo analysis um, that this actually works and uh, that the asymptotic results um, that are part of the paper um, also um, uh, are useful uh, to assess uh, finite sample uh, properties um, of the estimator. Um, so, so basically uh, that the asymptotics work, that the uh, asymptotic analysis approximates, the asymptotic thought experiment approximates well what is happening in finite samples. Um, but actually I'm always um, um, recommending this also to applied researchers. Um, so suppose you program up an estimator. Um, so what you want to do is you do want to um, check um, whether you did that well, uh, whether this this is uh, um, correct uh, what you've programmed up um, uh, before you um, actually take this to the data, right? Um, so um, what you then do is you run a Monte Carlo and you see whether you're able to um, estimate estimate back um, the parameters um, that um, that have um, uh, generated um, your artificial data set, right? Um, and um, uh, if um, if this turns out to be um, hard or impossible, then either you have made a mistake um, when you have programmed the estimator or uh, you have an identification problem, right? So it will be useful to know that um, it works because then um, you can be relatively sure uh, that you've programmed up the estimator in the right way um, and that um, uh, there is no big identification problem. That's not a proof of identification, but um, it's uh, definitely a good idea um, to uh, proceed like that um, because more often than not, uh, you will then spot uh, some mistakes um, and um, you will fix them before you even touch the data and um, normally it takes a while anyway until you have uh, cleaned the data or even obtained them. So um, in the meantime, you can always do this and uh, it will be useful um, most of the time. So highly recommended. Good. Now, um, the last thing I want to do is um, to talk about maximum likelihood estimation. That is a very, very brief uh, review. Um, in chapter 4.3 in the lecture notes, um, you can um, learn more, much more about this. Uh, so it's, it's a much more extensive uh, discussion, obviously. Here, this is just to bring us all on the same page um, because um, we're going to be, we're gonna be uh, using a maximum likelihood, likelihood estimation for uh, uh, the better part uh, of this first half uh, of the uh, course. Good. So what's the starting point? The starting point is that a probability model for the outcome y with support script y is specified for given exogenous variables xi and those have support script x. Uh, what is the support? The support is the set of all possible values um, uh, yi and xi respectively uh, can take on. Okay, so if yi is a binary, uh, then um, often we code it as zero and one, um, and then the support script y uh, would be um, zero and one, the set uh, consisting of zero and one. Um, so what is then done um, is one uh, specifies the density, one specifies a model, one writes down a model and we're gonna see this a lot in this course. Um, so we're going to specify a model and that model um, uh, implies um, uh, basically a functional form for the density of yi for given xi. Okay, and the assumption here, the starting point for maximum likelihood estimation more generally is that the density of yi given xi is known up to a finite set of parameters. Uh, let's call them theta. Um, and uh, the big theta um, is um, uh, the uh, parameter space. Um, so here uh, we're just going to use the um, uh, RP, okay, the, the p-dimensional um, real uh, space. Um, so um, think of uh, theta really as just like a, a vector uh, that is um, uh, p by one, okay. Um, 
and the true conditional density of y i given x i is denoted here um, by f of y i for given x i and then after the semicolon um, I've put um, theta naught uh, so theta naught is the true parameter value okay and then it's useful to um, uh, introduce uh, that notation at the last bullet point um, so that would be um, the um, likelihood, the log likelihood for observation i is denoted as L, script L i, um, and that's a function of theta, and that is the log of um, the density of y given x for any possible value theta, okay? Uh, and obviously um, it also holds um, that definition uh, for theta is equal to theta naught. Uh, so um, uh, this is useful because the i, the i subscript um, here um, uh, summarizes all the information in the uh, y i and the x i, right? And, and, and uh, I don't have to write out the log all the time. So here it's not a big deal, um, but uh, you will see in the lecture notes that this uh, makes the whole um, uh, write up a little bit more elegant. Now let's first talk about identification. Um, so um, identification again is the question uh, under which conditions uh, we can use the maximum likelihood estimator to estimate um, what we're interested in, which is theta naught. Okay, and what is useful um, uh, here is the so-called conditional kullback leibler information inequality. And um, that is not something um, that is a part of any econ program. Uh, this, this, is a, this is a property um, or an inequality um, that we take as a given. Uh, let me just explain to you what it is. Okay, so if you have a non-negative function such as f, okay, so let's think of f for the moment as, as any function there is. Uh, so what I need is that this function integrates to 1. So what is this f? So I'm, I'm holding x i fixed um, and I'm holding uh, theta fixed. Um, so there's only one argument. That one argument is the y i. I'm integrating over all possible values y i can take on. So that would be the, the support uh, of y i or script y. And then this integrates to one. So um, the uh, inequality will um, hold for any function um, that uh, integrates to one. What we then have is uh, the following uh, uh, thing um, that holds. Uh, so um, take the log of the ratio of the density. Um, so so uh, we're going to discuss this actually now like um, tailored to the maximum likelihood uh, context. Uh, so take the log of the density of the true density of y i for a given x i, so true density because here I have the theta naught, um, and in the denominator I have um, f of y i um, for any other value of theta. Oh well, any value of theta that I like, so it could be theta naught. Okay, so this quantity here is the log of the ratio of these two densities. So the numerator has the true um, uh, density, um, uh, and and the denominator has the uh, any density I like for any um, theta, but what I do need is that it's a proper density in the sense that it integrates to one. Um, then what I do here with this integral is um, I'm just taking the expectation over y. Well, how can you see this? Well, because here I have the, the true density of yi and uh, here I'm uh, integrating over all uh, values y can take on, so I'm just taking the expectation um, y um, and um, y enters twice here, once in the numerator and once in the denominator. Um, so let's think about the log. Um, so the log um, uh, is a concave function um, and um, uh, you know the argument has to be positive. So that, that always works here, right? Um, so um, um, because um, I'm actually requiring a non-negative function, okay? Um, so 
um, because these are both non-negative functions, uh, this will never be a, a negative quantity here. And the statement is, the inequality is that this expectation over the log of this ratio is never negative. It's always positive. Okay, so and that is that is a given. What we do now here is uh, we use that uh, to our advantage. So the first observation is that this is actually minimized um, at zero. Um, so we can ask ourselves at what value of theta is this minimized? Well, um, uh, when do I get to zero? I get to zero when um, the log of this ratio is equal to zero. And the log of this ratio is equal to zero if the ratio is actually equal to one. Okay? Um, because the log of one will be zero. Um, and when is this equal to one? Well, when uh, theta is equal to theta naught. Okay? Uh, so this already tells you that there is something special to setting uh, theta to the true value. And this is exactly what uh, uh, maximum likelihood uh, estimation um, is based on. Okay, so um, so this holds true for all x's because the whole argument that we have made so far is just for a given x. So we don't do anything in, in terms of uh, varying x uh, or the like. Um, so we do this all for a given value of x. Okay, uh, so once we um, have that, uh, what we can do is um, we can simply rewrite uh, this uh, information inequality in the following way. Uh, so we had um, the expectation of the log of a ratio. And we know that the log of a ratio is the difference in the log. And we know that the expectation of a difference is um, the difference in the expectation. So for all these reasons, uh, what we can write is this um, expression here. So this inequality here. So what is this inequality? It says that the expectation of the log of um, in the end, the true density of y given x, conditional on x, so it's a conditional expectation, um, is um, no less than the expectation of the log of um, f, this function f, um, the density for any value of the parameters that I like. Okay, so here I have theta naught, here I have theta, and what the um, uh, inequality implies is um, this in inequality here. It's just rewriting it. Now, um, once I uh, use the notation that I've introduced before, uh, then I can write li here and I can li, uh, write li here. Uh, so it means that the expectation of li evaluated at theta naught is no less than the expectation of li evaluated at theta. All this is conditional on xi. Uh, I've, I've uh, used uh, the inequality um, for a given xi as a starting point, so therefore I have to write here a conditional expectation uh, instead of an unconditional expectation. If I go back one slide, I see this also here. So this density is for a given uh, xi, so therefore I'm getting a, a conditional expectation here, 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 and here. Um, but now I'm going to make this unconditional. Um, so formally by iterated expectations. Um, uh, informally, uh, if this inequality holds for any value of x, uh, then it must also hold um, unconditionally. Uh, so, um, or when I integrate over x. Um, so uh, what I see here is that um, uh, the expectation of Li um, at the true parameter values uh, is always bigger or no less than the expectation of Li at any other um, or at any value of the parameters, any generic value theta. Um, so if I do this unconditionally, then I can say that theta naught maximizes um, the expectation of Li unconditionally. Okay, and that's that's exactly that's exactly what we need uh, for identification. Uh, because think about it, we don't know uh, uh, what value has actually generated the data, but we do know the model uh, that has generated the data, and we do know that uh, the only thing that's unknown is what value um, theta not of theta has generated the data. 
Here, uh, this inequality now tells us that um, once I'm looking at the expectation of Li um, and calculate this for different values of theta, the one that will maximize that expectation is the true value of the parameters. Ta-da! Uh, this is exactly what we need for identification and um, uh, then uh, it's, it's actually no surprise that uh, the estimator, the maximum likelihood estimator, is the solution to the sample analog of this maximization problem. So theta hat, my estimate uh, of uh, theta naught, is going to be the value theta that maximizes the average log likelihood in my sample. And in general, um, I'm just um, really um, obtaining this uh, numerically. Uh, so think about it. Um, what do you do in practice? Um, you have data, you have a model, um, and uh, what you then do is you program up um, for a given candidate parameter value theta um, for each observation i, um, the log likelihood contribution, and then uh, you can also calculate the average of those, and then you're going to numerically maximize with respect to theta. And we're going to see uh, how this can be implemented in MATLAB, but it's similarly easy to do that in R, Python, Julia, or whatever. Okay, um, in general, this solution is obtained numerically. There is uh, one special case that's kind of cool, um, and that is the case of the linear model. So once we have the linear model, um, y is xi beta plus epsilon, and we assume that epsilon is normally distributed, um, then uh, theta hat uh, can actually be um, uh, solved for and, and what we're going to find is that the maximum likelihood estimator is going to be the OLS estimator. So that's kind of a nice result. Again, I uh, refer you to the lecture notes um, to read up on that. Good. Uh, let's now uh, talk about a few things uh, that people uh, uh, sometimes mention in the context of maximum likelihood estimation. Um, so first of all, uh, the so-called score identity. So to talk about this, we first have to define um, the score of the log likelihood as the derivative of the log likelihood um, for i, L, the derivative of Li evaluated at theta with respect to theta. Um, so that's the first derivative. Um, and um, if theta um, is a parameter vector, um, then we take the derivative with respect to a vector. So Si is going to be a vector of the same dimension as theta because Li is a scalar. Um, so um, uh, if I'm having five parameters, uh, then Si evaluated at theta will be a vector that is um, uh, five by one. Okay, and the score identity now is that um, the expectation of the score at the true parameter values um, is equal to zero. What is the interpretation? The interpretation is uh, one of a first order condition, right? Uh, so we're maximizing um, the um, average log likelihood in practice um, that is kind of close to, um, so the uh, population analog again is uh, maximizing the expectation um, of um, uh, the log likelihood. Um, and uh, the first order condition is that the derivative of this expectation with respect to the parameters is equal to zero. And um, what we can do here, it turns out, is that we can interchange expect taking expectations and taking the derivative. Um, so here I'm having the expectation of a derivative, and it turns out that this is equal to the uh, derivative of an expectation. And therefore, the interpretation is um, that um, we look here at the first order condition for a maximum that is um, um, basically saying, oh, the, and, and, and what's happening is that uh, we get that the score of the expected likelihood is going to be equal to zero. And that is what is referred to as the score identity. Now let's briefly discuss asymptotics. Um, uh, so you might have heard before that the estimator is consistent and asymptotically normally distributed with variance covariance matrix given by the negative of the inverse of the expected Hessian. So what is the expected Hessian? The expected Hessian um, is um, 
so the Hessian is um, here denoted by HI. Um, it depends on the um, parameter value at which uh, we evaluate the likelihood function and the Hessian is simply the matrix of second derivatives of the uh, log likelihood contribution or put differently the derivative of the score with respect uh, to the parameters once more. Um, so the score um, was of dimension uh, before I used the example 5 by 1. Uh, so um, then I'm taking the derivative uh, with respect to the transpose of um, uh, theta that is a 1 by 5 vector. So I'm taking the derivative of something that is 5 by 1 with respect to something that is 1 by 5. So I'm ending up with a matrix um, that is of dimension 5 by 5. Okay, uh, so um, what you get here is uh, that this is the Hessian um, and then um, uh, the expected Hessian um, is important um, for the variance covariance matrix. Um, so you uh, would in practice calculate the Hessian at the um, estimated parameters um, and then take the average um, across observations um, and then uh, take the inverse of that quantity of, of that matrix um, times minus one. Um, second result uh, that is important is that um, the estimator is efficient. That's a great property um, and that is not completely surprising because we, we use all the information there is, right? We, we know what the model looks like. The only thing we, we don't know is um, what the true parameters are and these are um, uh, being estimated. Um, so in that sense, um, it's not surprising that um, the estimator is efficient. We can't do better than uh, maximum likelihood estimation. Um, as for testing, um, there is a so-called trinity of tests um, and these are called Wald, Lagrange multiplier or score test and likelihood ratio test. And I'm not going to talk about them here, um, but I do discuss them in the lecture notes uh, in case uh, you would need them. And the last thing um, is important is um, that the goodness of fit um, can be measured by uh, something that's called uh, McFadden's R square. And that um, does actually correspond to the R square measure that you have seen in the context of OLS estimation. So there the R square tells you how much of the variation in Y uh, can be explained by variation in X. Um, and um, uh, what we have here is that um, the measure is given by one minus, and then it's the ratio of two script L, um, uh, script L's. Um, so what is script L? Uh, so script L is the maximum of the likelihood for the sample. Um, so um, um, that is uh, the sum of the log likelihood contributions. Um, the, 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 the maximum of the log likelihood of the sample is the sum of the log likelihood contributions. Um, and uh, what I'm taking the ratio off here is um, the, um, the log likelihood for the sample, the maximum log likelihood for the sample when I make use of the axis divided by the log likelihood, um, um, the maximal log likelihood um, for the sample when I'm only putting in um, basically a constant term, right? So I'm, I'm, I'm uh, setting all the coefficients on the axis um, to zero. So here I've written it's the maximal log likelihood with covariates and without covariates. That's what I mean by that. So um, this does end uh, this first part of the course uh, that was meant as uh, bringing us all on the same page and next we're gonna um, uh, jump into the material of this course in the following video.